Well, welcome tonight, Arbor Christian Fellowship, our midweek uh, Bible study and prayer service. And it's uh, 6.30 in the evening here in California. It's getting darker, uh, coming here to wintertime and the time change. So uh, with focus on, on current time, I want to talk a little bit about eternity uh, time and some great promises the title of my message tonight is Living on God's Joy Standard, Philippians chapter 4. So take your Bibles, please, and turn to the book of Philippians chapter 4. And uh, we're going to hike through verses 4 through 9 and then do some stepping on a few other verses uh, in the fourth chapter as an augment and supplement to the, the study. In our American economy and politics, uh, we talk about the gold standard. Uh, talking about the, the gold standard and the silver standard and even oil, uh, gold standard. But we as believers in Christ, we have something even way, way, way better, and that's living on God's joy standard. And I bring up the word joy because in this little <clears throat> small book of Philippians, you know, it's a little sliver in your Bible, four short chapters, book of Philippians, uh, joy or rejoicing or rejoice is mentioned 19 times uh, in four brief little chapters so it's it's living living on God's joy standard and there's a couple of couple of things that's interesting about uh, this book and the fact that Paul talks so much about joy number one is the origin of this letter where it came from and to who it was sent so First of all, where it came from, Paul wrote this letter on death row in a Roman jail. It is believed by most scholars and students and uh, interpreters that, uh, that when Paul was in the Roman jail and was under the death penalty and was going to be killed, he requested a quill and manuscript and he wrote out as an end testament, end testament two letters. Uh, First, to his favorite church, the church in Philippi, his favorite church, and then to Timothy, his son in the ministry. And so, Second Timothy is, is, is called uh, Paul's last will and last testament. And you can make a case for the book of Philippians. Uh, also, uh, the book is bookended by the words grace. Actually, grace, glory, joy are words that repeat themselves. Salvation repeats itself. But uh, it's, the book is sandwiched with the word grace. In Philippians 1, 2, Paul says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And then the very end of the book of Philippians, the, the very end, uh, the very last verse, Philippians 4, 23, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. So this is a grace sandwich. It's saturated from beginning to end. It's gated and guarded and guided by uh, God's grace and God's uh, joy. So it's interesting uh, being on death row and talking about joy. Uh, when Paul wrote this letter, he was jailed, but he was joyed. He was in prison, but he was praised, and he was locked up, but he looked up. And he encourages us uh, through this, uh, through this uh, book. So we're going to take a look at the fourth chapter. Now, a couple other things. Uh, the, the Philippians were people who were in the city of Philippi, and uh, many of you probably never ever would have heard of Philippi uh, unless you did Bible study in the New Testament. Or, uh, But uh, what's fascinating and interesting is that Philippi was the first city in Europe where a Christian church was planted. And that was by Paul, Silas, Timothy, and his entourage. And uh, it's interesting that uh, he writes back from prison later on as the church was pretty much established. Uh, an encouraging, an encouraging uh, letter. He had heard that there was some persecution by the, the Romans. Uh, oftentimes in the early part of the New Testament era, when we think of persecution against the Christians, we think it was big bad Rome. And yes, that there was big bad Rome, but initially the persecution came from the Jews, from the Jews towards the Christians who felt that 
Jews who became uh, Christians, what nowadays Messianic Jews call being a completed Jew, uh, were traitors and, and betrayers. And so uh, Paul had a group that followed him around and harassed him and uh, caused trouble. And so he had heard that in the church of Philippi, there was a group of Jews that went there to disrupt things and cause trouble and uh, make life miserable and try to straighten them out. So uh, this is a joy letter, but it's also a Jesus letter, which means stick with Jesus. Don't don't give up on, on Jesus. So uh, a couple of uh, interesting uh, verses from chapter 1. Uh, chapter 1 is a verse... Verse 21, Paul writes, For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. He knew he was in death row. Maybe he had 50 to 60, 72 hours left to live on this earth. And that was only a temporary, transitory life. And then he graduated up to fulfillment, eternal life, forever, ever, ever joy. Uh, Verse 27 of chapter 1, he encourages the Philippian believers in, in this verse. It's a little long verse, but uh, it's worth uh, kind of just taking a look at it very briefly. Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come to see you or remain absent, in other words, if I get released, I'm going to come see you because that's where I'm headed once I'm out, or I stay in, uh, I want you to remain uh, in the faith. I, I want to hear that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. And here's a picture of an outstanding church. They're standing firm. Now, we're seeing transitions today and movements like earthquakes uh, in, in politics. And uh, we had an election that... Uh, you know, people didn't know what's what, and uh, I'm convinced that there was some cheating going on somewhere. I think we all know it, yeah. and, uh, and and things, and the whole climate of, of everything is going. Uh, so we see that the Christians need to need to do these things. Number one, stand firm in one spirit and with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. And just because there's political corruption or political uh, uncertainty, that's no reason to stop being fervent and fiery and faithful in presenting Jesus Christ and building our church until the rapture. The rapture is Christ returning, and that means all the Christians are going to go up in the air. And when I first heard this, I thought it was ridiculous. I was a brand new Christian, and I said, that's the strangest thing I ever heard. But it is true, because God said it. I might believe something is weird, but that's me. Okay, maybe I am weird. But God said it. I, I believe it. And you know what? We need to be living in these days and times to keep one ear open to that trumpet sound. <laughs> and we just, you know, you saw the, 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 the rocket uh, taken off yesterday uh, to the moon. And that launch, and uh, my understanding is it's the largest rocket they've ever launched off and things. And, uh, well, we're going to have a liftoff. We're going to have a liftoff one day if we're still on earth when Christ returns. First, invisibly to bring his church home, Amen. and seven years later he comes back visibly to earth to straighten it out because when all the Christians are gone, there's going to be a seven-year time of chaos with no firm foundation of belief and faith, Christian truth, and biblical values. Uh, it's called the, the tribulation, and the, the end of it, the last three and a half years, the great tribulation. So with all that kind of stuff going on, and just the, the, the persecution that Paul was experiencing, being in prison, being beaten, knowing he's on death row, knowing is that his hours and days are short, he writes this next to the last letter uh, to the Philippian church, and the theme is rejoicing. Just imagine Imagine the counterpoint, death, punishment, execution, and rejoicing. So, Philippians chapter 4, verse 4 through 9, and then as I go along in the study, we'll supplement it with a few other standalone verses from the end of this chapter. Paul writes, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say, rejoice. 
All right, we understand clearly and perfectly what rejoice means. In the New Testament, the word joy literally meant to shine. It literally meant that we shine, we, we shine. That, uh, I call it shiny believers. And uh, we are the light of the world. Okay, we are the light of the world. And I think in uh, physics, it is impossible to uh, uh, shine unless there's a light. And Jesus Christ is our light. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit, or King James's moderation, your self-control, let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. And here's the, here's the payoff verses. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Secret of joy in the book of Philippians is prayer. Joy, glory, and prayer are concomitant in this little book. He says, in everything, by prayer, supplication, thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. He repeats himself using different words. Uh, prayer, supplication, thanksgiving, request. Now, prayer is general communication with God. Through our relationship with God, being in the atmosphere of God. Supplication is specifically asking for something. Specifically asking for something. And then thanksgiving is giving thanks for the very things that you've asked for ahead of time, showing faith and trust in God. And uh, God loves that. Uh, God just God loves it when we have faith and believe and, and trust in Him. And uh, even though uh, the Bible talks about childlike faith, uh, we as grown-up adults, we always talk about growing up and Growing up in Christ, and yes, maturity, yes. But there's an aspect of also growing down in Christ like a child. To have childlike faith. And you, you tell a child something, they'll believe you. They'll, they'll believe you. And having childlike faith is believing and trusting and acting upon the very promises of, of God. So we see prayer, supplication, thanksgiving. And then we're going to take a look at uh, the word peace. Uh, the word peace in verse 7 and verse 9. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, all right, that's like when a preacher says, now, in conclusion, or finally, if you're ever at Arbor Christian Fellowship, and in the middle of my sermon, I say, and finally, and in conclusion, <laughs> they know there's still a little, little teeny weeny ways to go. Well, not always teeny weeny. Uh, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, honorable, right, pure, lovely, good repute, excellence, if anything worthy of praise, dwell, live in these things, meditate upon these things. Meditate on these things. And then in verse 9, the things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, as Paul being an example, practice these things. In other words, live it out. And the Lord God, the God of peace, will be with you. Notice verse 7, the peace of God. Notice verse 9 ends with a God of peace. Live in God's peace. Uh, Paul writes in verse 9, I have learned. I have learned. Jump down to verse 11, two verses down. Uh, a beautiful uh, a verse. Verse 11, not that I speak from want, but I have learned to be content in whatsoever state I am in. That's King James. Even if you're in the state of California or state of confusion or some other situation, I have learned to be content in whatsoever circumstance or situation I am in. I want to focus on that word learned, on that word learned. Uh, have you ever run across know-it-alls? They, they know everything and uh, they're unteachable. That's in a very bad, dangerous place to be. Uh, you know, when I got my seminary doctorate and my Master of Divinity degree and another degree, I'm full of all kinds of degrees. <laughs> and sometimes I can be the stupidest person in the world. When I got that, that seminary 
degree, they call it terminal degree. That's, that's the highest you can go. And there's a reason for terminal. I mean, you get out and sometimes you're just dead to some things. But, uh, you know, I, I kind of thought I knew it all. And basically, that seminary degree said, I know nothing and I need to learn and be teachable. And our whole lifetime is a time of learning. And notice, Paul actually said, I have learned. I, I have I have learned. Uh, notice uh, in verse 9, these things you have learned. But in verse 11, he says, I have learned. So you know this is coming. What does the word learned here in the New Testament Greek mean? We know what to learn something is. Uh, the word actually is the word matheno. Matheno. It's translated learned. And literally what this means is to learn in two ways. Number one, learn by observation. Seeing things, but more likely uh, the dual meaning is to learn by experience. To learn by living it out. Uh, a person, uh, let's say a preacher boy in the church is called to preach. He's 20, 19, 18, 25 and uh, the pastor says, okay, I'll take you in as, uh, uh, I'll be your mentor and for six months, and we'll get you licensed to preach, and then as God opens the door and you get a church, uh, you know, we'll, we'll do an ordination uh, service, but you are now in a learning, learning process, and in a church, uh, the, the, the way you learn is by observation and by experience. I had the same experience when I got out of the service. God had called me to preach. And instead of going to uh, Cal State Fullerton and Fullerton Junior College and UC Berkeley to get a journalism major, to be a sports writer, I went to Fullerton JC two years, got an AA degree, and then junior, senior year at Cal Baptist University. But during that time, I had the privilege of earning a living by being an associate pastor to Crescent Southern Baptist Church in Anaheim with John Jackson as pastor. Now, he was a great pastor, and he had a knack for taking in young strays, young men and some young women who were going to the mission field and to mentor them, to train them. And uh, I, I, I got a great opportunity to be the actual associate pastor and, uh, and things. And uh, I, I learned a lot by observation and by experience. I, I, and this is no criticism of Pastor John, uh, but watching and learning, I also learned what not to do, because he, like a lot of pastors, and myself included, made mistakes. The one redeeming quality in me about mistakes is that I usually make the same mistake only once. I don't make the same mistakes over and over and over again. Uh, I make new mistakes, fresh mistakes, but uh, be that as it may, when Paul writes, I have learned... I have learned, I have learned, verse 11, to be content. I have learned to be content. And that content, uh, that, that content literally means to be at peace and satisfied and to know how to receive the things that God has. It may not be what Paul specifically would have liked to have or wanted, but God always gives what is needed. So living on, on God's joy standard, uh, living on an earthly death row, we see Paul realized his eternal life and his eternal finality. Yes, jailed, but joy. Yes, imprisoned, but praising. Locked up, but he looked up. Who did he look up to? Well, he looked up to the God. Verse 7, the peace of God and the God of peace. Uh, he rejoices. He, he rejoices. I use the term relax on the outline uh, in verse 11. I don't know how exegetically appropriate that is, but it does begin with the letter R, and you know, I'm crazy. I'm hooked on alliteration. I know it can be exasperating and irritating to some people in my congregation and, and stuff, and you know, it's, uh, uh, that it works for me. And uh, But we rejoice, verse 4, and then because of our rejoicing, we relax. Not that I speak from want, but I have learned to be content in whatever situation I'm in. He, 
he had learned that. It's a, it's a lifelong lesson that we learn by observation and experience. Eternal life, eternal focus, uh, the finish line. Uh, let me see if I wrote something on the back of this. Uh, the finish line that Paul was going. Now, Paul looked at his life as a race, uh, one as a run. Uh, those of you that ever served in the military, you know that they have endurance runs. Uh, you run a lot. I mean, you run a lot. And uh, when I was in the military, uh, we had a, a long-distance run. I mean, uh, people were dropping out, falling all over. And, and uh, you know, the one thing that you never want to do is on the race, you could maybe slow down a little, maybe you get back on the back of the pack, maybe you're fast walking, but you don't want to fall over because the DIs and the running instructor would step over you when you were down. <laughs> I mean, that, that's how they train you. Uh, yeah, I, I saw it. I, you know, it, it happened. I saw it. And uh, that was great motivation, at least for me and probably for a lot of other guys. Uh, so we rejoice, we re relax, and then notice we receive. Notice we, we receive. Verse 19, my God will supply all your need according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Now, it doesn't say, my God will supply a few of your needs. Uh, he, he'll, he'll supply uh, some of your needs, uh, but it says all your needs. Uh, and let me just repeat myself. Uh, there's a difference between needs and wants, you know. I want a Ferrari, but I don't need one because you know what? I'll be getting tons of tickets. I'll be getting tons of tickets and not afford the insurance. And I'll probably wreck it some way, somewhere, somehow. So I'm content with God's, with what God has given me. Uh, more than I deserve, I drive a Hyundai. And love the car. It gets me where I need to go to teach God's Word and visit. gets me where to go to take my daughter to school and here and there. And got me here tonight to lead in this Bible study and, and prayer time. Uh, he will supply all of our needs according to his, his glory. So as I wrap this up uh, uh, tonight, remember we're living on God's joy standard. We can have joy even in a negative, not so good situation. Most of them will be temporary. And as we are tested, as we going through some uh, struggles, uh, it strengthens our faith. Have any of you viewing or anybody here around this table, uh, I'm not saying that you were a committed, dedicated bodybuilder, but did you ever do any weightlifting? Maybe you were in high school playing football or high school track. <laughs> and... Uh, and uh, yeah, you're, you're doing the, it's called resistance training. It's called resistance training. And when I did a little bit of that, I couldn't even pick up a 25-pound dumbbell. I couldn't even barely, barely pick it up. And that's lightweight for guys. And the first day I went to the gym, I got a membership at Gold's Gym and uh, went to the, uh, excuse me, 24-hour fitness in Las Vegas when I was pastoring there. I walked in. Had my, you know, sweats and gym clothes on, walked in, looked around, all the guys working out. I was terrified by the intensity of the guys working out with all these weights and all these strong buff guys. And, you know, here I was, as skinny as a willow tree and, and things like that. <laughs> and, and, but, uh, but I hung in there and worked out and, and, and stuff, felt better, felt good, and, and, and all that. Our, our Christian life is also like a workout. Uh, in weightlifting, you develop muscle by resistance on the forearm, on the, you know, bicep and tricep and quadricep by resistance. And we get stronger in the faith when there is resistance from the world. When things uh, were resisted, uh, some of these things can either make us or break us. That resistance can bring strength. I remember the first time I was ridiculed for my, my faith in Christ. So what hurt was it was by people of my own age. And I went back and I told my spiritual mentor. And he says, hey, rejoice that you were worthy to suffer ridicule and be made fun of for your faith in Christ. And I said, 
Yeah, I guess you're right. Hey, praise God. Pray, you know, praise God. And so we realize here that we have two things. We have joy and peace. Joy and peace. And that's what I want to close off uh, tonight, our study on, on joy and peace. I challenge you this week to read through the book of Philippians. Uh, maybe take a blank sheet of paper and a pen or pencil. And uh, it's four brief, very short chapters. And write down two or three or four good memory verses to work on. Philippians 1.21, For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. It's a great one. 4.13. 4.11, 4.19, uh, You can pick all the years out that are meaningful to you. So I challenge you this week, uh, live in the book of Philippians and have that joy, that peace, and, and know God's glory. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, we come before you and we thank you for Paul and the book of Philippians that, uh, that you led him to write. And even though he was on the throes of his deathbed, he can still rejoice knowing that his words will live on. Perhaps he, he didn't know that uh, 2,000 years later in Southern California on this Wednesday night, a group of people and people viewing on the Internet all across America and possibly in some places in the world would be viewing and listening and looking and focusing on Paul's writing and, and verses Nevertheless, you have given these scriptures to us that we can know you, we can grow in you, that we can glow in you, and that we can go for you. So we just thank you. We just thank you. Pray that we can rejoice in you, and we can have your peace, know you, the God of peace, and have the peace that you give. For I pray in Jesus' name, amen. This Sunday, 1045, this Sunday, 1045, I'll be preaching. We'd love to have you visit and continue. God bless you. Call some friends and tell them, hey, watch this. All right, God bless you. Good night.